Good evening. My name is Logan Court, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that Dickinson College is on the unceded lands of the Susquehannock Nation. We acknowledge the many indigenous peoples that lived with these lands, as well as the thousands of indigenous children forced into the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in 1879 as part of a federal cultural eradication effort. On behalf of the Clark Forum and the Office of the President, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event, Presidential Dialogues, Lessons in Leadership. This program is part of the Clark Forum's Leadership in the Age of Uncertainty series. College and university leadership is a prestigious and complex role that involves balancing the well needs or the well-being and needs of students and faculty with overall college resilience and advancement. The job of college president is surrounded with myths and stereotypes, such as the incorrect stereotype of the aloof fundraising figurehead, and the reality is always more nuanced. Now more than ever, and especially at small liberal arts schools, college presidents need to be multifaceted leaders who help drive cultural and academic change on their campuses and beyond. A liberal arts president is expected to be a driver of institutional improvement, a leader in their career field outside of the college, and a down-to-earth person who is able to relate to members of their college community at all levels. These are all expectations that our guests this evening exhibit quite successfully. One of the main reasons I chose Dickinson as a school to spend my four undergraduate years was a speech President Jones made at my high school, our high school. Uh, he spoke about the importance of leadership that created societal change while staying true to your roots before introducing our recently departed President Ensign to speak on a similar topic. Thinking back on that presentation, I am struck by how well President Jones and Pe President Emeritus Bill Durden have lived up to that idealized form of leadership. As a college tour guide, I find myself highlighting many of the campus-wide projects like the statue of Benjamin Rush, our study abroad programs, and the college farm that are hallmarks of President Durden's tenure here at Dickinson and the lasting impact he has had on our campus, classrooms, and extracurricular programs. President Emeritus Bill Durden served at Dickinson for 14 years as president and was a professor of German and education. He currently serves as the president of the International University Alliance, chief global engagement officer at Shorelight, a courtesy professor at Johns Hopkins University, and an operating partner of Sterling Partners. Interim President John Jones is the recently retired chief judge of the U.S. Middle District Court of Pennsylvania. He presided over high-profile cases, such as one that deemed teaching intelligent design in public schools to be unconstitutional, as well as the 2014 Whitewood versus Wolf, which struck down Pennsylvania's ban on same-sex marriage. Jones is the recipient of the John Marshall Judicial Independence Award and the Geological Society of America's President's Medal. And in 2006, President Jones was named one of Time Magazine's Time 100 Most Influential People in the World. There'll be a question and answer session immediately following the program, so please hold all questions until that time. The Clark Forum welcomes differences of opinion expressed politely, thoughtfully, and succinctly. And disruptive behavior or harassment of the speakers, members of the Dickinson community, or audience members will not be tolerated. As a show of respect to our speakers and everyone in attendance, please still stay until the end of the program, including the question and answer session. At this time, I ask you to please silence all cell phones and other electronic devices, and now, Please join me in welcoming President Emeritus Bill Durden and Interim President John Jones. Well, good evening to everyone. And it's, uh, it's great uh, to have such a, a, a wonderful crowd. And I'm so honored to be uh, with my dear friend, uh, President Emeritus uh, Durden. I, you know, I remember. Uh, as, I was, as I was reminiscing about things in preparation for tonight, um, I, uh, I, I, I think of so many things, but I remember in January of 2006, and I was sitting in my chambers, and I received an email uh, from President Bill Durden of Dickinson College. And I should tell you that I was I don't know that I was a lapsed alum, but I wasn't as engaged as I could have been or should have been, perhaps. At that point, I was pretty wrapped up in my judicial career. And the email uh, from President Durden asked if I would uh, accept his offer to give the commencement speech in 2006. Uh, and I stared at the screen. I could not believe that I would be asked back to Dickinson to give the, uh, the commencement address. It, it was. Uh, 
it, to, to me, um, it was the most um, overwhelming and outstanding thing, and indeed the, the speech was, uh, for me, uh, uh, one of the momentous times in my life. But I, I quickly answered Bill, I, qu I quickly answered yes in the email because I thought if, if Bill thought about it, he might take it back uh, <laughs> and, and wouldn't do it. Now, Bill, we've come the full circle, haven't we? Uh, how do, how's it feel? Uh, to, I know you've been back a fair amount. This is not your first trip back since uh, uh, you uh, moved on from an enormously successful presidency, but how's it, how's it feel to be back? Well, before I answer that, John, let me also express my uh, admiration of your career uh, as a judge. And in addition, as an alum, my gratitude for your being in this position currently. So thank That's you. very kind. Thank as you. As an alum, I say that. Thank you. And, thank you. Um, thank you. You know, it's, it's every time, this is to me a second home. I mean, I, I spent now 18 years here. Uh, and uh, every time I come back, I, I kind of goes through my head. I have to decide whether I'm back as a student, which is a hard <laughs> show, true. Uh, or I'm back, <laughs> I'm back as, as president. And then I just realize I'm back. And, and I, I have, I'm a person of, I'm a, I'm a person of certain patterns. When I come to a city, I, I do a certain yes. walking tour, and I stop at certain places. And I have to say, I did the same thing today. I, I mean, I, I walked to the same places on campus, and then I walked downtown, because the community is, you know, we tried it. it, it they, they were a part of the family. And so I did my walk downtown, and it was great, because you know, people stop you and say hello, and you get right back uh, into it without the responsibility that's of the right. presidency. <laughs> so, uh, oh, that's, yeah, but uh, we'll get into that. But, I, uh, I haven't gotten to the point where I'm hiding. Uh, no, no, right? no, 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 no. But um, nevertheless, I think people know that, um, and, and we'll get into this as part of leadership, but I was known as a student uh, also of walking a lot in town, and I'd walk the alleys. I'd always walk the alleys. And I always thought they were interesting because they weren't where other people were walking. And that maybe I'd see something different. And uh, that's what I did today. And so it, it, was, it was great to be back. You know, of course, people wonder what I'm walking down an alley with a bow tie on. <laughs> <laughs> OK, whatever. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it, it, is, it is very uh, comfortable to be back. Well, you know, you, you make a, uh, made a comment, and it, it resonates with me, because it all mixes together, uh, having spent seven years in Carlisle uh, as, a, as a college student, as a law student, and now back uh, for this. Uh, I don't have the span that you had, but um, it, it, it all sort of morphs together. And because of the sort of historic nature and the, and the way that our campus is set up, the views and the sort of vignettes that you get are the same ones you had as a student in many cases, with exceptions, obviously, uh, for the beautiful new construction, the science building, all those yeah. things. I wonder if you had the same reaction that I did. We sort of came from different places, but we ended up the same place. It's sitting in the corner office in Old West, um, uh, and I'm thinking back to your first days as president, I remember looking out on the John Dickinson campus and watching people walk there, and you, you have this sense, how did, I, how did I end up here? Because if you've been a student here, yeah. it's, it's the last thing that you necessarily expect that you're, that you're gonna do. Did you have that moment, or do you recall well, that? Well, it, it's interesting, and I, I would get into this too, but um, I just happened to be a first-generation college student. Uh, I had when I was accepted at Dickinson, and that's a funny story, I guess, how I found out about Dickinson. And I'll tell that. I mean, it's something. Yeah, how'd you find that. out? I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell this because it's kind of funny. I, I, uh, my, for my parents, again, I'm being first generation, nobody in my family, direct line, went to college. And, um, but they were, I was going to be the one to break it. I was going to be the one to, to shift. And uh, my mother and father both were um, appropriately invested in my getting the best education I could. And in seventh grade, I went to uh, a, a day school in Albany, New York, the Albany Academy, very old institution. 
And uh, that was my first shift into another environment. Uh, my father had uh, retired from the Army after 30 years, but taking time out to play minor league baseball and be in a rodeo. And <laughs> when he retired, he became a cook. And he was uh, eventually a chef at a, at a local hospital. And my mother was, was in the home and uh, working. And uh, at the school, which, which I'm still very close to, uh, I'm indebted to them, um, at the school, I, uh, I really didn't get any advice on colleges. And because I was kind of not really in the society. Uh, and so my father and I, on a Saturday afternoon, we would watch sometimes a football game, and then we would watch um, GE Academic Bowl. And it was a quiz program. Colleges would, you know, questions that irritating me now. It's like facts, facts back and forth. And uh, there was one college in 1966 that kept winning. And it was undefeated. And at the end, my father looked at me and said, that looks like a good college. <laughs> and I said, yeah, it looks pretty good to me. And I applied early admissions to, to Dickinson. And that was it. That was it. And the rest is history. Well, I guess the rest is history. But uh, that's how that happened. So you, you, so you, you, you came to Dickinson. You spent your four years. And, and, and of course, uh, part of the, the great class of 71 that just had a, a terrific reunion that uh, yeah. I, I was fortunate enough to to uh, be a little bit a part of back in, in June. How do you think, and we're talking about leadership now, and how did Dickinson prepare you for what came afterwards? You had a life, obviously, before you came back to us as, as uh, president, but you, but you had leadership roles. You still have leadership roles. Um, how did Dickinson foster that? What, what, did, what, what did your I'll, Dickinson education I'll do in your experience? I'll answer that, I'm going to come back and ask you the same question, because I'm curious about that. I, I did, several things uh, happened at Dickinson that, that encouraged me. Um, the first is a more personal one. Uh, and it is the beginning, it was the beginning of an understanding that institutions can have personalities. And I'll get back to that with leadership. And I, I took that into other institutions where I was involved and, and looked for the personalities and tried to nurture the personalities of the institutions. And the reason I say that, I think before my father ever, uh, my mother visited Dickinson, they'd never been on a college campus. And I didn't know how they would react. And my father said to me, I like this place. I'm comfortable here. They're not pretentious. They're not pretentious. He said, it sounds like a really good school, good academics, but they're not pretentious. And I realized that this, and it turned out to be a good place for a first-gen kid. But I also was very struck in my commencement. And I looked out, and I saw my mother sitting inside stone walls, but I couldn't find my father. And I knew where to look beyond the stone walls because he still didn't feel comfortable inside. But nevertheless, he felt comfortable to be there. So there was that leadership moment. I started to understand personality. And as leadership, you have to strike or find the personality of the institution. And Dickinson happened to have a good one. And I think it's still at the soul of the institution. Uh, the other was um, mentorship. Uh, I never would have known what a Fulbright was, but I had faculty members here who said, try this. Um, I, they told me about going overseas. I did that, and that's turned out to be a big part of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and additionally, I think that another part of what Dickinson did, which has been extremely important to leadership, is that, well, two things. One was they very early taught me about connectivity, connecting disparate fields of study. And I did that. I mean, I did German philosophy. I did all sorts of different things. 
And additionally, there was the notion of creativity innovation. I don't know how many people know this, my classmates do, but believe it or not, my senior year, I was silent for three weeks. <laughs> Part of my senior honors project, talk about experiential learning, I irritated everybody on this campus. I'd answer the phone and wouldn't say anything. <laughs> And I try a tapping system. I tap once to try to get them to understand I was saying yes, and twice if I was saying no. And I, I mean, this was just woven into my, my senior honors stuff. I mean, my god, the, the ability to, to take that risk on a student was wonderful. And, and frankly, this, this, this stayed with me, because when I was selecting graduate schools, and I was looking at them in, in philosophy and in and, and in, in German, and I had a choice in German between Hopkins and University of Chicago. And I wrote the chair of Chicago, and I said, I'd like to come to Chicago, I'd like to do a doctorate in German, but I also want to take classes in classics and philosophy. And I also wrote the chair at Hopkins. The person in Chicago wrote back and said, you can't do that. You're going to have to take only German courses. Hopkins said, go ahead, whatever you want. I went to Hopkins. So that was part of the lesson that this was so important to have that connectivity. Now you, John, what about you? You know, I, I, uh, it, it's a mixed bag, somewhat similar and some, in some ways different from, from yours, Bill. I, uh, I, I think that Dickinson served me so well in terms of uh, igniting my intellectual curiosity. Uh, I, it was there. I, I don't know that it was latent, but I don't think it was as developed as it needed to be. And I, um, I, I truly became a, a, a product, one of the products that I think we've, we have been striving to, to um, uh, have as, as, a, as an example of a Dickinson education over the years, which is a lifelong learner. And, and that broad-based education and that intellectual curiosity a, has served me well. You, you know, I've had the great good fortune to uh, practice law, to uh, serve uh, in a senior post in a governor's administration, to be on the federal bench for uh, 20 years almost, and now this, um, which was an unexpected career turn, to be sure. And I think the other thing is that at Dickinson, given the community, the small community, uh, uh, but the vibrant community, you learn about people. And if you, if you don't have a, a, a reasonably good EQ, and if you don't uh, learn about people um, in, in the way that you do in a, uh, the, the close quarters of a residential liberal arts college, then you're not going to have the the tools and the talent to uh, to lead. Uh, I I think that informed me uh, as well, and I think the last thing, and it, it really plays off what you said, Bill, is, uh, and I've said this, you know, for years, Dickinsonians, uh, properly produced by this great college, don't duck a challenge, um, mm -hmm. and when. The board called on me back in uh, back in May, and the you know this life-changing uh, call I had from uh, uh, my friend uh, uh, who uh, had served with me on the board, um, Jim Chambers, uh, and said that the board wanted me to step up and to do this. My first impulse was to say, "You." You want somebody else? Uh, the, 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 Interesting. I, I've, I've never done this before, uh, and and it wasn't false modesty. It was it was an absolutely uh, sincere reaction, and yet, when I hung up the phone, and I thought about it in the ensuing days, I thought, no, that's not that's not the way I operate. Uh, you know, I'm 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 going to. I'm going to duck a challenge, and I and I I can't I can't do it. First of all, I love this place too much, but I and I have too much uh, of my my passion and my time invested in it. And 
wanted to succeed, but, but that was part of it. And I think I learned that, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I learned that at Dickinson College. You may fail occasionally, but you, but you keep at it. And um, we do have that modesty, that element yeah. of modesty that, yeah. that uh, again, to, to play off your point, um, we are, um, I, I, I went to, um, I was telling some folks about this, I went to the inauguration of uh, a, a, a president at a nearby institution last week, and I sat next to uh, another uh, president who's sort of in the conference, and um, she had, I, I won't name names, but uh, she had a big gold medallion around her neck. Absolutely, yep, I know where you're going. And, uh, yeah, I know where you're going. And, uh, and, and so did the new, newly inaugurated president. And, you know, she said to me, don't you have a medal, John? And I said, no, I don't. Uh, and she said, well, you should get one. That would never work no. uh, here. But, you know, I mean, you're never going to see a medal hanging around my but, neck. But you know, John, you, 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 we know that, you know why that was. I mean, that, that was that was. Tell me, you got rid of it? No, 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 no. no I didn't do that. I got I got rid of all the past presidential <laughs> portraits. <in that. laughs> uh, they're they're being restored. Um, but uh, the the uh, it, way I have it, it was. Again, he's a very controversial figure, and much more discussion is needed. But our founder uh, believed that any ornamentation was too English, too royal. And therefore, as president, we were to wear nothing but what we earned, which was our that. degree. Now, I didn't know that. Yeah. I, didn't, I wasn't aware. I just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of being president, by the way. Just uh, yeah. <laughs> no, not, it's true. I, yeah. <laughs> oh boy, I laugh. Be be, I, I laugh because years ago I was at an event with uh, Justice Sandra yeah. Day O'Connor, and there was someone there, and he gave a speech uh, at this event, and we were at a, a, a very small gathering for breakfast mm -hmm. with with uh, Justice O'Connor, and he stood up, uh, a friend of mine who's since passed away, who is a, a, a senior judge, and gave a uh, speech and he quoted Abigail Adams. And uh, we finished and the then Chief Justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and this uh, other judge and I were talking and he said, uh, Steve, he said, where did you come up with that quote from Abigail Adams? And he said, I just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you can't do that. He said, you <laughs> Well, we're living so, in an interesting time. Uh, but, yes. but, but, <laughs> so, you know, you, you were president for, yeah. um, uh, you know, a decade and a half, basically, yeah. almost, yeah. And, uh, here. And uh, you saw uh, the college go from, you know, uh, really uh, what, and I, I know You'll be modest about this, but but I'll say it. It was an inflection point in the college's history. The college needed uh, the kind of leadership, the kind of bold leadership that you brought to it, um, and um, and it, it you, you know you put this place on steroids, uh, and it and it became so successful, um, and 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 so well known. What? How did you? What what? What was the secret sauce during the Durden uh, administration? What, what propelled uh, Dickinson's rise during your, your well, decade and a half here? Well, John, first I'll, I'll start by uh, introducing some of the secret sauce. Uh, <laughs> I have some really terrific colleagues who are here tonight, uh, part of our team. And uh, there's Bob Massa, who was vice president of a lot of different things. <laughs> including admissions and my goodness what a what a and communications and uh, head of athletics and uh, everything and Annette Parker CFO who's back is on your team so there's yes, a little cross yeah, generational yeah, uh, yeah 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 at least I think that's Annette Parker <laughs> that, that's it is okay and Karen Karen Farinak who is uh, part of the team and actually you, John, because you were on the board. Uh, well, yeah. And you gave us the go-ahead to do stuff. Well, they're all good friends. Yeah. Uh, and Annette, I, I, I kid, is like the uh, Frank Sinatra of CFO. She retires, then she comes back. And uh, so yeah. we, what's that? Madonna. Uh, oh, yeah. No, Madonna, okay, sorry. The Madonna, yeah. the Madonna of CFO. But, but, but I but think, the, yeah, go ahead. Great, It's a great team. But uh, I, think, I think part of it, and that's a comment about leadership, um, I tried to bring together people who are passionate about the location, the place, and also who knew more than I did. Uh, and I think that's 
One thing that is absolutely critical to not be afraid of that. Um, but you're, you were an idea person, uh, and I, you were always that. Uh, There's another the, word for it, uh, BS. No, no, no. <laughs> no, but I mean, from the time that I, from the time that, uh, that uh, yeah. I, met, I met you and, and we got to know each other well, but it, it, the legend here among, uh, yeah. you, you talk about your team, the legend was that uh, when you got on a, uh, a, a sort of an idea bender, they would come fast and furious, and, yeah, uh, yeah, well. and then they would, they'd be going uh, eight different directions at once. Is that something that you developed over time, or were you always that way, that you, you just would sort of brainstorm and, and, and come up with ideas? No, uh, I, I've, I've always, been, unfortunately, been that way. <laughs> but, but, I, but I would say I would say this. I don't think it's a vice. I think it's, no, uh, well, so, so no, much. No. But uh, I think uh, there's, there's another part about this that, that's quite serious, and, and, it's, and I'll talk more maybe in some classes, too, about this and some other students, but it, it's really where my liberal arts education, we can get into this, but my liberal arts education has really translated into an essential aspect of leadership. And that is, for me, you know, leadership is a really, leadership studies, leadership itself, it's a strange term because as far as I can tell, it's a very American concept, leadership. And you talk, you know, you go to Europe and you say leadership. Now, Germany is a different story, and I was just there for three weeks, but it, they just stay away from the whole thing because leadership turns into Führer, you know, mm -hmm. and that's the word, mm -hmm. not good. Um, but uh, other countries, you talk, start talking about leadership, what is that, what do you mean? You, know, you, you, you study leadership, you talk about it, it isn't it, it's not that way that someone you know, rises to this leadership position. But I found, that um, the most essential part of leadership for me is actually what I studied in liberal arts. And I studied literature. And I studied literature in graduate school. And you might say, what could be more useless? I studied philosophy, good grief, I mean, you know. Uh, however, critically, in itself, and I don't want to downplay this, in itself, critically important to maintaining interest, your own interest in things, and trying to understand the world and other people. But also, I critically believe that literature is narrative, is storytelling. And storytelling, for me, is leadership. A good leader assesses the situation, looks at what is there, and creates an authentic, legitimate story, which others, like reading a good book, you want to be in the narrative. You want to be in there. And so there's a certain excitement also to that kind of situation. I agree, to create your, your narrative. Uh, That's did, right. did you have a... Uh, and it doesn't have to be somebody who you were in close contact with as a, as a uh, uh, who mentored you. I, I know that you had a, a time that you had a relationship with Tony Blair, the former yeah. prime minister of, uh, of uh, England. But yeah, that was quite an experience. Yeah, uh, and we can talk about it. Well, let's talk about it. Uh, for, for the students who are here, Tony Blair, a couple times removed, was the prime minister of the UK. Uh, and he uh, uh, was was a successful prime minister yeah. of, of some duration. And Bill, uh, talk, uh, yeah, you came to know tutor. him. I was a private tutor. Yeah, for, uh, talk about the that. American mind. Um, yeah, this, but this is a good example of leadership and what you need to do in leadership. Uh, it, it's partly, you have to engage, uh, this is an old phrase we used when I was here, we have to engage the world, you have to be out there. And when I was at Johns Hopkins, where I've worked for most of my time, uh, I, I was writing and I was speaking, and, and a person in the UK, Sir Cyril Taylor, read one of my pieces. And he called me up in Baltimore and said, I'm coming to town, could I meet with you? And he was the advisor to six prime ministers on, on education in the UK. And uh, he came to visit, and very pleasant, and then he left, went back to the UK and he wrote me and he said, would you uh, come to the UK and give a keynote 
um, having a conference on education. So Elk and I, my wife and I, went over. And one of my maxims about leadership, and this goes to this achievement without pretension, is don't belittle any area of knowledge, <coughs> any source of knowledge. You never know what's going to do it and where it's coming from. And that means not belittling people either. You never know where it's coming from. And so uh, I was at the dinner, and here's this guy, you know, who's arguably is, you know, relatives came over here as indenture or something from England. And I was at the Sir table, Sir Humpty Dump and Sir this and Sir that. <laughs> All right, you can see my American uh, cynicism. But anyway, here they were. And there was this fairly, and I, I want to be gracious, a fairly arrogant person on my left side who kept pumpering. And by the way, the women had to sit at another table. Am I making myself clear here? OK, <laughs> so we're sitting, I'm sitting with the sirs. And this one guy <laughs> looks at me. And finally, he says to me, and he said, do you know the Spice Girls? <laughs> Can you name the Spice Girls? I looked at him. And I said, yes. And I named them. <laughs> and he, this is, this is a true story. And he looks at me and said, you know something about us. Well, you know who he was. He was the head of EMI Records. All right? And they were signed with him. He leans over to the guy on my right, with whom I never spoke at that point. And he said, Andrew, he knows something about us, this American. I know about the Spice Girls, for goodness sakes. Why did I know about the Spice Girls? Because on the flight over, I was reading everything I could get my hands on, and I read People Magazine. <laughs> and there was an article on the Spice Girls. You know, now, I could have gotten Tony about this, right? If I were not a Dickinsonian. Well, that's that. I would have looked for War and Peace on that plane. Yeah, sure, right? that's right. No, but I read. No, intellectual curiosity, No, Bill. intellectual that's curiosity, that's yes. You know, people ask <laughs> right up there. And uh, anyway, he leans over and he said, uh, Andrew, uh, Again, he knows something. Andrew looks at me, and we, have, we start having this rather unusual conversation about politics, the American mind, and you know, I'm using all my liberal arts knowledge. At the end of the conversation, this is before iPhones, uh, and while I was at Dickinson, you know, he, he leans over and he looks at me and he says, uh, what are you doing tomorrow? Now, I wasn't doing anything. But I made it look like I was doing something. So I, sort of, so I said, well, I, he said, do you have any time free? Well, I had nothing. And I, I said, yes, I think I can do it. He said, please come to 10 Downing for tea. We'll have tea. Again, before 9-11. So next day, Elk and I were both invited. We go over to 10 Downing, and it's before 9-11. I go up to the Bobby at the front. He looks at me. I said, I'm Bill Durden. He said, yeah, hi. He said, go down there and knock on the door. I said, what door? He said, number 10, knock. <laughs> so went in. Well, it turns out that the person I met was Andrew Adonis, Lord Adonis, who became Minister of Education, Minister of Transportation, on and on and on. And uh, he was at that time head of Tony Blair's domestic policy unit. And we had a three-hour conversation. I mean, a grill conversation on politics, American mind, creativity, innovation, this is where that liberal arts education, you've got to be prepared for everything. Constantly scanning, looking, reading. You never know when it comes in handy. And uh, at the end of it, he looked at me and said, the prime minister would like to speak to you. I said, what world am I living in? You know, I'm just a bloat off the street here. I'll, I'll, I'll I don't know. condense it, OK? He said, but not now. He's in there with the president of France. Yeah, right. So is the Pope. But he, he <laughs> I'm a little, you know. So anyway, he said, go back, go back home, and we'll contact you. And I said, so will the Pope, you know. And uh, a week later, I'm sitting over in the old president's house. Bing, 10 Downing Street comes in. Uh, get on the plane. It's all arranged for you. Uh, you will have the prime minister's car for the weekend, the JAG, with the baby seat. And it was all coded. I came in. I love like, when that happens. Yeah. It, oh, it's, it was, I had the car, and, and this beautiful car. Yeah. And I had, you know, the gossip with the driver. I found out all about Bill Clinton and the baby and loving, you know, this little thing. So anyway, uh, I went there. Uh, 
to Ken Downing again. Tony Blair bops down in shirt sleeves, shirt tails hanging out. We had conversation after conversation, energetic, hopping around, grilling me all about the American mind, creativity, why the heck are we so creative, you know, this kind of stuff. I'm making it up right and left. And uh, then he looks at me, and President Bush had just been elected. And he said, tell me about President Bush. And, you know, I made up some stuff. And, but then there was a comment, and, I, you know, and I, was, I was really struck by this. Sometimes when you get a chance, as you have, to be in kind of a history in this mm -hmm. way, he looked at me and he said, in retrospect, it explains a lot in why Tony uh, it went south. He said, I don't care who it is, I will do whatever a president of the United States asks me to do because we're so indebted. So, so indebted. That explains quite a bit, yeah. Explains a lot. So, yeah. so who, you know, obviously you, you came in contact with Tony Blair, but it, it, talk about, and, and again, I started to say before, not, it wouldn't necessarily have to be somebody that you were in close contact with, but historically, is there, is there someone that you believe set a template that uh, is worth uh, emulating? We're all our own people, yeah. of course, but is there, is, do you have somebody who's a, uh, a role model uh, that, that you've admired, that, 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 uh, that you think is, is uh, uh, someone that, that, you know, could be um, a role model to folks in our audience uh, that, you would, that you would commend them to? Well, yeah, they're numerous, uh, but some of them are, are more specific. I mean, I, I, I was nurtured in administration at Johns Hopkins. It's a wonderful institution. It's a tough place. Bob will, will know. It's a, it's a tough place. And Bob survived it for a good number of years. I survived it. Um, when I, and, I, and this is another leadership thing. Some le mentors are critical. And John, I want to hear yes, about your mentors. Yeah, yeah. Mentors are critical. But too frequently, we end up with a mentor who's a little too polite. And that's not good. You want a person who's humane, but you want a person who's straight shooter. He's going to push you, yeah. 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 And, and I was lucky. The former Steve Muller, the former president of Hopkins, who was there 18 years, uh, and his uh, the provost, Dick Longacre, they were, they were my, my mentors, and I admired them for various reasons. But I remember the first day at Hopkins, and I was 30 years old. First day at Hopkins working. Steve Muller looked at me and said, Bill, there's good news and bad news. This is the President of Hopkins. Good news and bad news. I said, well, okay, what's the good news? He said, the good news is that you're at Johns Hopkins and you have a faculty appointment in Arts and Sciences. I said, okay, what's the bad news? He said, the bad news is we love you, but if you don't raise money, bye-bye. <laughs> well, I raised money. And boy, was that good. And I get this. I mean, once I went into the provost, again, a good mentorship. And he sort of took me on and was nurturing me. And I went in with the first time with a report, and I was kind of positive in this. He said, stop me. He said, don't give me this bull. He said, I don't want to hear this song and dance. It's all great. Tell me what's wrong. Tell me. So that set a tone. Yeah. And how about you, John? What, what, where, where, what? Well, you know, you were talking about your experience of coming here, and uh, and, I, and I was thinking about my own experience. Uh, you know, very sadly, uh, when I was a student here, my dad died. Uh, mm. he, he, uh, he died in the midst of my, my junior year. And, and that can untether you for mm. uh, a yeah. bit. Uh, and I, I had a good life. I had a fortunate life. I, I, uh, I didn't want for anything, uh, but I... Uh, you know, when you have that happen to you, you have to sort of recalibrate yeah. in your life. And certainly in my younger days, my, my dad was a, was a great mentor to me, but then you don't have that. And I have been blessed throughout my life with people who would, um, whether they were judges or whether they were older lawyers, um, uh, and then I had a political career, uh, people who would take me under their wing. Probably the one that's first and foremost is, is and, and you know this, we've yeah. talked about it, is, is uh, former Pennsylvania governor and yeah. Homeland Security Secretary yeah. Tom Ridge. Yeah. And to your point, <clears throat> what he did is he would push me out of my comfort zone. Yeah. Uh, and um, he, um, 
uh, he's he, really, um, you know, he called me after I, I accepted this job and it was announced publicly and we had the most wonderful chat and he said, uh, I knew that there was another act in your life that you were gonna do something else and, and to have somebody believe in you and to push you uh, like that is, is the, the most marvelous thing. But in terms of leaders, you know, one of the things that I've, uh, you know, you, know you, you, you get to the point where we are in our lives, you, you've experienced a lot of leaders, um, and I think fairly you can take away a lot of negative lessons. Uh, yes. There are people Absolutely. who fall into leadership roles and probably don't deserve them, right. um, and then there are people who earn them richly and, and, and do well. I, uh, the, the leadership style that I know you did not have, and I don't believe that I have, and I call it the hairs on fire leadership school where, you know, it is, it's, uh, everything is a crisis. Um, you're running hot all the time. Uh, it, 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 I think it's devastating for the people who work with sure. you, uh, because they're at DEFCON 1, uh, constantly. You can't operate like that. Uh, they're afraid to tell you things. Uh, and I've seen leaders, uh, who are misplaced leaders in that situation, uh, that's also called the screamer school, you know, where uh, you're afraid to disclose something to the uh, superior because you're afraid of the backlash or that you'll be blamed for it. The best leaders I've seen in my life <clears throat> are the ones who don't try to be someone they're not. You, you can't change that. Uh, and um, you, you have to, you know, people say, you know, what, what makes a good leader? Well, I think you can develop talents as a leader, but first and foremost, I think you have to be yourself. If, you're, if you are you're sort of copying a persona that, that you think is appropriate and it's not an, it's not an authentic one, you're gonna have problems uh, yeah. because you can't keep that up. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you are who you are. I think to be genuine is, is uh, an essential part uh, I've learned along the way of, of, uh, of being a leader. And, and also, you know, the concept of loyalty up, loyalty down. Yep which I know you know well and, and, and I, I know was a part of your leadership style, which is you can't expect the people who work for you and work with you to, to be loyal to you and to perform for you if you're not gonna be mm -hmm. loyal to them mm -hmm. and, and, and have that same uh, respect for them. Uh, I, you know, those are things that you pick up along the way, but I'd be interested in your, your perception. What, you know, what's your style? What's your leadership style? I, I, <clears throat> I, I know it pretty well, but for those who yeah. don't know it. You know, uh, yeah. um, I have to tell you, a little secret, I never really think about leadership. I just don't. I, yeah, I, yeah, just, yeah. I just, I just, I really don't. Right. I yeah. mean, I just like doing stuff. So. I like poking around. Yeah. I like, you know, it's, it's a. Uh, well, that's, that's the yeah. authentic part because, yeah, you, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about it too much, then you're not going to lead, right? I listen, mean, I like, never <clears> dreamed <throat> of being, I, I did not seek a presidency. I just didn't seek this, and there's a little story behind that. That makes two of us. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> sure, I know. well, that that's kind of interesting because yeah. we're both Dickinsonians. But um, I, I just didn't, and and I, but I, I this is another, and for the students here, it, it, and we can get into this. But a liberal arts education to me, you know, increasingly there are all sorts of attempts to justify liberal arts on a skill-based uh, platform, skill believing that it's closer to job, you know, getting into jobs. But I think there's another part of this, and I meet numerous colleagues and professors here. I, I still think there's a huge part of all the liberal arts, and, and you know, I had a job in, at Bath right after um, Dickinson, where I would be commuting to, to the UK, to Bath, and, I learned very quickly there that liberal arts, for them, is only the humanities, not the sciences. But if you look at all the liberal arts, I really think in their best form, which translates to the pragmatic world without a lot of ado, to do, and that is all this learning is really about understanding who you are. It's a gradual evolutionary process of a lot of information from disparate fields, from disparate stories, examples, um, testing your reason, testing your logic. That prepares you 
in the best way to reach out to others because you do it in an authentic way. And you actually feel good about it. You're not mm -hmm. walking around saying, gee, what personality was I yesterday? That can really, as you say, trip you up. Sure. You know, it, it, it occurs to me, you know, we, we were products of, of a 1970s uh, era and, and an education in the 1970s. And you talked about your own experience in coming here. I, I know that um, it was just understood when I uh, applied to Dickinson that Dickinson was a superb school, yeah. uh, that I would get a great education. I don't recall overthinking it. I had been to campus, I had interviewed, I was comfortable here, um, and it was sort of game, set, match. I was, it was my first choice. I was, I was excited to be uh, uh, accepted at, at Dickinson. You, you know, and, and I know, that uh, the world has changed. Uh, it's, it's different today, um, and it's much more competitive and uh, can you talk a little bit about, I, I, because I think you certainly saw this evolution during your, your presidency, and, but in your time in higher ed as well, where we've become um, sort of results uh, oriented and, and we're much more clinical about the way we uh, choose schools uh, today. Talk about what you've seen over the breadth of your your uh, career in, in higher ed, in, in, you know, your presidency, your post-presidential period, your pre-presidential period, how has that evolved in terms of how students look at, uh, at colleges? Well, I, I think, um, and let me put this in context, I'm glad, because I, I chair the board of a, a nonprofit institution in Los Angeles College, which is really in the industry, in film, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and so I, I try to keep up with these sure, sorts of things in right, other, right. other contexts. I think there has been, it's, it's, the, it's a pressure that is placed upon the liberal arts as being useless, uh, too ephemeral, and therefore students have, I believe, and correct me, uh, students have been in a context, a societal context of value for the money, quick return, uh, a pragmatic, practical education. Nothing wrong with that. However, um, let me put it this way. And, and you know, I kind of still write a lot and publish some things, commentaries on education. I'm working on something now. And I, I want to see what you think about it very concisely. I want to see what you think about this. It's what I was just thinking about today, walking around town. Um, if it, there is an association between leadership and education in the U.S. You, you educate, and you have it here, you educate for leadership, right? You know, I often wonder, well, who's going to follow if we're all leading? You know? but, but the issue is you educate for leadership. And if you go back, again, citing Benjamin Rush, who was instrumental in setting up a distinctive U.S. education, uh, he basically said that the that a liberal education, and he modified it, uh, all due respect, Mark, he modified it, as you know, we've been through this, he, he modified it by saying he thought that Americans didn't really need Greek and Latin, uh, they needed the modern languages for commerce. And they needed chemistry, because they needed, that's the, that's the, that's the subject of connectivity. Now, I wanna be cautious here. He said Americans don't need to write and to speak Latin and Greek, but they certainly need to be able to read it because it has important stories, all right? He selected that education, liberal education, and he said that those who went to college should have that education to build a new nation. So he already started to link it to something useful, the practical education, liberal arts. The issue, however, when you think about it, the liberal arts were initially the form of education that went exclusively to, you guessed it, dominant white male European origin students. So liberal arts was that vehicle, that form of education. Now, you might say, given that, 
throw it out. But here's the problem with that. And I once wrote in the context of online learning. I did an article once on this. I was watching the introduction of online learning for undergraduates, full-time online learning. And I noticed those speaking for it were the already privileged. And I noticed that their kids were still getting a liberal arts education. But this was a time when many students of color were coming onto the educational scene. And they started to advocate online learning for those students. Wait a minute. They were using liberal arts education to have privileged positions of leadership historically. They knew the secret, but they didn't want others on it. And I think this is kind of a lesson for contemporary students. It's a lesson that we, yes, we need to expand the curriculum. We need to bring in whatever best, anywhere, any people, any form, that best informs us about aspects of life, communication, relationships. But to denigrate the liberal arts is nothing but a ploy to keep certain populations of the American public away from the curriculum for leadership. Well said. I mean, I, 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 I concur, absolutely. I think, too, that, uh, you know, in the world that we live in that has become, uh, as has often described, a sort of road rage uh, society, uh, one of the best antidotes that we have uh, against that is, is a liberal arts education, is a worldview, um, is an informed citizenry, is a, uh, uh, a populace that, um, that can lead, uh, that can reason through problems. Um, I'm not naive. I, I understand uh, how searingly uh, difficult uh, things can be and how uh, high temperatures run in this, in this society, but I think ultimately our, our salvation uh, will be that, that intellectual curiosity that leads to, I think, ultimately a greater degree of civility. Uh, because we, you know, you can go back to Benjamin Rush's time and find really uh, vituperative, difficult battles, personal attacks against yeah. people. That's part of the fabric of the American life and political system. But I think today there's something much darker uh, that, that has taken place that, um, that uh, w we need to be um, leaders uh, in institutions like Dickinson in, in restoring the ability to solve problems, uh, the, 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 the difficult problems of our day, and, and to do that in a way that ultimately becomes uh, more collaborative and more civil. Again, without a, you know, saying that in a, in a stroke of naivete, I, I, I think that that uh, our liberal education, liberal arts education, helps to foster that. I really do, uh, and uh, and I think I think you, from everything I know about you, Bill, you feel similarly. I believe. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I John, I want to ask you though. It, it, uh, As we're getting you, we're getting yeah, closer. But, Mark, are we taking questions tonight? Or are we? I don't. I don't. Yeah. We're going to take a few. All right, we got that. All right, go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. Oh, I just wanted to ask you, I, um, you've had a distinguished career as a judge in law, and you made some critical, important decisions. Uh, erudite, incredibly well written. What do you see, you know, crossing, crossing borders? I guess that used to be one of our old phrases, wasn't it? Crossing borders. Yeah, that's it. Uh, gee, where'd that come from? Uh, but what, what do you see from your law? background, your judging background, that you're perhaps using in the presidency at this point? What, what, what is carried over? One of the things that you, that's a great question. I mean, one of the things that, that, that happens to you um, as, a, as a district court judge, uh, we used to say that we were the last of the great generalists because of the subject matter. It, it could be so disparate on any given day, hour, you know, week. And um, if you don't have the ability to process um, a, a lot of information mm -hmm. and prioritize it yep. and get it straight in your head and um, just really, really assimilate that information and, and turn it into something that's productive, which would be the outflow of a judge, then um, you're not going to be very effective. 
uh, as a judge, and I hope that I was during my tenure. And um, you know that, uh, because it, it, it's really not different at all. Uh, I mean, the issues can be different, but the, but the job is hardly different from your time, that uh, when you're a college president, uh, it, it can be like drinking from the proverbial mm -hmm. fire hose. Mm -hmm. uh, on any given day, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things coming at, at you. And at night. night and <laughs> night and weekend and, and so forth. Yeah. And, I, and I think, you know, that ability to um, take a whole bunch of disparate yeah. information in, in myriad areas and, and to process that and, and to turn it around into action, hopefully action, uh, you know, that's, you know, I, it's part of what we do. Yeah, uh, I think it's so. spotting, the, spotting the issue, making a decision of what to do, but then, critically, and this goes back to liberal arts, what's the context? Well, it, it, what's it, the context? as I used to say when I was on the bench, you know, you'll get a decision from me. It may not be the decision that you want, but at yes. least you'll get a decision from me. I mean, that's the other thing. I, with, with great um, forgiveness to my, uh, asking for forgiveness from my, my wonderful uh, uh, folks with whom I work every day, we do, we can um, on campus sometimes have a tendency to, to talk uh, about things uh, maybe a little longer than we should. Uh, and uh, I, I tend to get to a decision point, I think, uh, a little more quickly. And uh, that's... Uh, I think we share that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know we do. Yeah. Uh, we do. Well, Bill, thank you. Let, let's, thank you. Uh, and th this has been wonderful. Thank you for joining me tonight, uh, President Emeritus Bill Durden. I am, I'm so thrilled to have Bill back uh, uh, on campus and participating. This was the one thing when I took the job uh, that I was most uh, uh, ginned up about in terms of uh, public appearances, and, and I'm, I'm so gratified and, and uh, touched that Bill uh, would come back. Uh, and uh, Bill has been, a, I, I want to say this very publicly, Bill has been a great resource. Uh, he's always there uh, when I need him for uh, uh, advice and counsel. And uh, when you talk about mentors, I've got a great one as, uh, as uh, uh, the President Emeritus. So uh, thank you, Bill, for coming back. Well, I appreciate it. And let me also say it takes an outstanding president to reach out. And that's the other part of it. So many people don't. And that's yeah. wrong. It's a, it's a, it was, yeah. it's Do we have honor. any tough questions it's, it's or outrage? Honor. How about or something any, else any going questions on from here? the audience? We, I guess we'll, we'll take a few uh, questions. Um, any hands? John will answer them. <laughs> <laughs> it is now time for the question and answer session. Because this event is being recorded, please wait for a microphone to reach you before asking your question. We reserve the first questions for students, and then we will open up to the rest of the audience. We'll now take the first question. I know students definitely want to ask us some questions. Just let it rip. There's one. Yeah, let it rip. Good. You want to get a mic up? And congratulations to you with your gray hats. Thank yeah, you. We got some a compliment of gray hats. Thank you. Uh, what are your values of, as a leader, and have they, how have they affected you? Could, you could pull a mask yeah, down while yeah. you're talking. What are your values of, as a leader, and how have they affected your career? I'm not sure that I heard it. I'm saying it. What are your values as a leader, and how have they affected your career? Oh. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, well, I think that um, you try to be honest, authentic, direct, um, the other value is to not let things linger, that you approach them, you get a process of settling them. Um, respect is huge. As I said, respecting everyone. Um, you know, I, there's certain things you can't stop. I do one thing. I do one thing immediately when I come on campus. And I can't stop myself doing this. I go to the kitchen. I go to the kitchen. And I say hello to the kitchen staff. Well, my father was a cook. I relate. But we chat. And that's respect. I respect what they have to do. And I get some good information. Uh, advice, actually. I did. I still do when I walk over there. But nevertheless, I think those are, those are my basic values. But you know, they're always evolving. They're not settled. 
And that's what I find uh, still, still fascinating. And I, and I think <clears throat> playing off that uh, appropriately, um, certainly honesty uh, first and foremost, but also to say thanks. And, and I, I hope mm. I do it enough, and I'm not sure that I do, but for the, the, the many, many people uh, uh, who, who work with us here and, and, and make this place, this wonderful place, what it is, uh, it, it is, uh, it's appropriate for us to say thanks. And, uh, and I, um, I try not to miss that opportunity. Uh, when I gave the convocation this year, I, I, I said to uh, the students, those of you who are there, that uh, make sure you thank uh, the, the folks who are cutting the grass, the folks who are setting up the, uh, the platform, you know, putting the chairs up and taking them down, the people who are you know, fixing uh, the electrical systems, all those guys that, and gals who make this place go. The, the, uh, uh, certainly our great kitchen workers who are working shorthanded um, show appreciation. I mean, I think, I think that's part of what it means to lead. It's a good question. Other questions? Was there a, a point in any of your careers where you, you sort of knew you were wrong but had to go with it anyways, and then how did you deal with that? Knew you were wrong and with the wrong position? Yeah. Um. <laughs> of course not. He's the real president. Of course, I've never. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'll tell you what, I, as a judge, uh, I had a couple of cases over the years, and they were usually on the criminal side, uh, that I wish I could, wish I had redos on, that, that, that kept me up uh, at night. And, and I don't know whether I was wrong necessarily, but I, I, I didn't like, I, you know, in retrospect, I, I, I questioned what I had done. And, you know, they say some, sometimes my, my great friend, Judge Maslin, is, is here and colleague, and I, you know, you, the best thing you can have sometimes as a judge, a trial judge, is a short memory. But there are ones that you wish that you had back. And, uh, you know, you, you just have to, you, you have to push through that, and, and I think we've all made some bad calls in life, uh, you know, things that we wish that we could take back. I'll, I'll, I'll play off that for just a second for you, though, and I, and I say this to, to you guys and my, my gray hat friends and, and you know, everybody else who's in the sort of formative years, uh, if there's one thing that um, every, particularly every white collar uh, defendant always said to me every time that I sentenced them, it's this. They always said, you know, Your Honor, if I, if I had the opportunity to take this back, to do it over again, I, I would do it. And, and you know, uh, what I would say to them is, unfortunately, uh, on, on matters like that, matters of reputation, matters of uh, criminal behavior, you don't get a do-over. You know, you can't go on Amazon Prime, Amazon Prime and get a, a, a new reputation, you know, once it's gone. So uh, we'll all make mistakes in life. It's the kind of mistakes you make, and it's whether you learn from them. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, the be I will tell you this also, you know, the best lessons I've ever learned in my life have come from mistakes uh, that I've made. It, you know, your, your, your successes <laughs> and your victories in life don't always teach you any, any, anything much in terms of uh, growth. They're wonderful things when they happen. You, you fail at something, you know, you, you generally, um, there's a lesson that's a hard lesson, but you, you learn something there. Bill? Yeah, I, I, I want to, let me put it in this context. I've run into a lot of young people. They're afraid of making a mistake. I understand that. They're afraid of the wrong choice. And I guess from the example of, uh, you know, example of one, my own life, and that's why I'm here to talk about it, I guess, um, you never really make a mistake. Because everything, you learn something from that. Or everything, there is an element that you, you're surprised when it returns. And it's you, I'll give you one example. I, I've been in a lot of, a lot of it's simultaneous. Don't think I jump from job to job, a lot of it's simultaneous. You know, I've been an army officer, 
I've been with the State Department for 11 years, chairing an international commission, traveling every conceivable place in the world, uh, you know, uh, with a major research university here at Dickinson, with a private equity company, now with a startup, uh, all this. So it's, it's been, it's, for leadership, it's been great because I've been dipping into different sectors. And the one element I'm proud to have been a commissioned officer, obviously willing to serve and proud of that. But I soon realized it, it wasn't for me as a, as a profession. I respect those who do it. My father did it. It wasn't for me. So I could say, yeah, that was something that was a non-starter. Fast forward to when I'm at Dickinson. And I get a call from the Middle States Accreditation Commission, or whatever it is that you know, keeps mm -hmm. us going, gives us so that we can give you degrees. And they said, we're looking for a college president who had military experience. And in your generation of Vietnam, there aren't many. And so would you chair the uh, evaluation of West Point? Well, there several decades later, this, this thing that I thought, well, I didn't do, I mean, I, okay, but I didn't do that great. That's, you know, kind of a waste. Uh, not, well, let me put it kind of, it's not a waste. Uh, you know, just let me be understood. It's not a waste. But for me, personally, it wasn't a match for long term. And just one quick add to that it, that shows you how you never quite lose, and maybe this is that Dickinson thing, I was chairing that and part of chairing the West Point visit and part of that, the chair of the commission, the chair of the, the visiting committee, meets with the chairman of the board. So I was brought into a big room, sitting there, big table, nobody at the other end. Suddenly I hear do -do 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 a helicopter lands right outside the door. Out walks the secretary of the army, who's the chairman of the board, two three stars, two two stars, and one one star. And they're sitting at the other end. I'm sitting way at the other end, and I didn't say anything, like, oh my God. <laughs> and then my colleague nudged me and said, Bill, you're in charge. I said, yeah, but they're all generals. I was a first lieutenant. <laughs> it, it, it never leaves you. It doesn't leave you. So that's a long-winded story to say, everything you do, you can learn from it. Sure. Everything. Absolutely. Other questions? Ah, yeah. Hi. Good evening, and thank you to you both. Um, I guess my question is for President Emeritus uh, Bill Durden. Um, what do you think Dickinson, or what efforts do you think Dickinson could make um, in making campus life more enjoyable for uh, students from all demographics? Dion, <laughs> Dion and I know each other. We're, 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 he's from Baltimore. And we uh, we uh, were engaged in a, a youth fellow program. And, Who doesn't know Dion? Who know Dion? <laughs> Dion, I'm going to be I'm going to be um, judicious here, uh, and that is I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment on current activities. That's not my role anymore. So, if you would like to direct it to my good <laughs> colleague, right here. <laughs> so, I, I did, I'm not. I'm not, I appreciate the question, but I'm not in the game. We're working it, Dion, you know that. You come, come and see me, we'll chat, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Other questions? Oh, okay. Well, thank you to you both. I, was, I wanted to know, um, what is your favorite part of being president of Dickinson, least favorite part, and then for President Jones, what was the part that you miss most about being a judge, and um, then what part um, you miss about um, no longer being, for President Jones, for no longer being president of Dickinson, what part do you miss? Simple, students. Yeah. I don't even have to think. Yeah. I mean, good colleagues, but <laughs> you never and being a president, you always get you know, a little, no, no, they're at, at really good colleagues, uh, but students, students. I, I, look, I just love interacting. 
I used to scare them because I'd look, I mean, because I had this trick. And the trick was this. I had to do, I had to raise money. And you have to travel to raise money, all right? So what I did was, and I, and I love doing this, when I was here, I was always out, always out everywhere. So when I'm away, the student thought I was still on campus. And, and, and it was, it was kind of interesting that, that they, oh, I just saw you yesterday. Oh, no, I was in Los Angeles. <laughs> but it, I, I, I just miss chatting with them, talking to them, hearing their ideas, uh, debating. It's all part of this education. It's all part, D disagreeing. You know, we used to have these conversations. You know, they'd look at me and they'd say, you're not, you know, I'd say, you're not, a, you're not, you're not agreeing with me. No, you're not listening. You go back and forth with this. It was great. So uh, my, my son is a 2011 graduate, uh, uh, gray hat, and uh, he was editor in chief of the newspaper. And of course, Bill was president. And he would, um, he would uh, email me or call me, and he'd say that I, in his capacity as editor, he just had coffee with President Durden, which he, he loved to do. Uh, and and uh, Bill, in his quintessential way, would, would push Son John. Uh, he would, he would uh, evaluate critically the op-eds in the paper and uh, disagree with them. Uh, and, um, and, and of course, John would get a full head of steam uh, and and uh, and go right at it and debate uh, Bill, and so I'd get it from John's perspective, and he'd sometimes be frustrated. He wasn't sure that he made his point with Bill, and then no sooner would I hear from John than I hear from Bill, he just, and he'd tell me, "I just had the greatest debate with your son," uh, and and they would go back. But so I'd hear like in stereo uh, from the two of them. And, and I, I couldn't agree more with Bill. It's, it's the students. And that, that doesn't take away from any of the other experiences or the wonderful people that we work with. In terms of what I miss most, I, I don't really miss anything um, particularly about being a judge. I am wrapped up in this. I, I love the job. I'm, I'm all in. Uh, I had my time you know, over 19 years. I spent a month, frankly, wondering where I was. Uh, and. Uh, when that settled down, and I, re I realized that I'd left, um, I do kid with people that, uh, you know, when you take off the robe and you and you uh, resign your retire your commission, you uh, you, you lose your superpowers, uh, and so I I, I don't have uh, the power to move uh, things with a stroke of a pen the way I used to, and it's more the power to persuade and to lead, which is why we're here and what we're talking about tonight. But that's okay. That's fine. I I. Uh, I had a good run, and uh, this is a wonderful job and a, and a great opportunity. And it is sure better, uh, you know, trying to move the ball and and uh, and work at this wonderful place than it is uh, incarcerating people, which can suck the the life out of you if you do it uh, long enough. I, I did my job, and it was a it was a great job to have, but uh, I, but I moved on. I think that's we're about eight fifteen, I think, uh, and. Uh, it's been the most wonderful experience. I'm glad to have Bill back here. Thank you all, and, and those of you who uh, participated by, the, uh, by watching the, the live streaming tonight. Uh, this, this has been a, a, a wonderful occasion to have Bill back. And Bill, uh, as much as you want to come back and see us, uh, we're, we're delighted to have our President Emeritus with us. So thanks, thanks for John. being Very here. Very gracious. Thank you all. Thank you.